Welcome everybody to Dead Talk Live, and tonight we have director William Brent Bell, whose latest movie, Orphan First Kill, is now streaming on Paramount+. Plus. It just came out several weeks ago, premiered April, uh, August 19th to be exact. Yep. Uh, Brent, thank you so much for being on our show. Congratulations on the huge success of the film. First off, how are you doing tonight? I'm good. Thank you for having me on, man. It's great um, to have you back. And just like we were saying, yeah, it's been a bit. It's been almost a year and a half. It doesn't seem that long. So let's get down to this amazing yes. film. Um, as we were talking a little bit before we went live, tackling a sequel, it could be a slippery slope, especially in horror. Uh, so when you were asked to take this project on, what were your thoughts? Uh, did you have any reservations considering how popular uh, the first one was? What was going through your mind? Yeah, you know, um, I was a big fan of the first one. So when they asked me to read the script, I was pretty surprised. It had been 12, 13 years by that point. And um, I was surprised they were making another one. And I was like, well, as a fan, yeah, like I'm excited to read the script. But I was like, but I have, a, I, you know, I'm probably not going to be the guy to make the movie because I can't imagine how you're going to live up to this great twist the original is so well known for. And then I was like, and I don't really know where you start trying to, like, find a new Isabel Furman to play <laughs> Esther, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, and then I read the script and I was like, whoa, this is not what I expected, you know? And uh and then it became like, okay, now what do we do about what do we do about Esther? You exactly. know, and uh, so so and actually it was Isabel who reached out to me, um, and I was doing the screening that night, and she was and I was like, come to the screening, and she came out and met me, and then I was like, whoa, like and she she just you know, she looked the same, and um, just a little bigger, and uh, she was just really excited about like. It was her character, and she's like, yeah. "I don't want to let her character go." So anyway, so, th so so it was all a crazy process. That that sounds crazy. So was it the original plan to cast someone else as Esther? I don't think any. I think I don't think anybody really thought, thought that we far could ahead. Cast her. They, I think everybody assumed that's kind of out of the. That's not going to happen, and um, but we we were just getting into prepping the movie or or developing the like second third draft of the script or whatever when um she reached out to me and so the, everybody was like they love the idea and i know they had been talking to her about a cameo before wow. um, i came on board and um but like i said when i met her i called the producers and was like this could really work you know yeah. with her and it's just changes everything and uh and they were like we can make it work we love the idea um you know it's just like can we do it yeah uh, we're gonna so. get into that in a bit <laughs> uh we're gonna talk more about isabel now as a director like we talked about of a very popular first film taking on the sequel did okay. paramount allow you uh artistic freedom or being a big studio, this was a big studio film, did they try to guide you, sort of like repeat what they did in the first one, but just in a different scenario? You know, nobody ever got specific with me in respect to how I was approaching directing the movie, you know? And then as far as developing the script, you know, the first half or more very you know it was on purpose that it kind of mm -hmm. felt similar to the first movie in some ways we wanted it to feel different but at the same time familiar and um almost to where it might lead you down the path that this is just going to be another yeah you know, same thing as the first time sort of but it's not and, it's completely no. different and, and the writer like like alex mace who created this sort of all with David, Leslie Johnson, McKittrick, um, they cracked the kind of angle of this movie. Mm -hmm. And then David Cogshaw, the um, wrote, you know, screenwriter, really came in with this fresh kind of fun energy to the story. 
So, so, you know, we were making this movie also like right at the height of COVID. One of the first kind of movies out of the gate, there was no vaccine, there was nothing. Wow. So the fact that we were making it, the fact that we were making it with Isabel, like, um, you know, everybody was, was just trying to make the best movie we possibly could. So nobody was trying to control or anything like that. Yeah. It was, uh, it was just, just, we were just all try shooting to- yeah just try to do the best that you can under the very hard conditions of covid and i i thought this was probably shot during the end of covid because i mean everything was so beautifully put together now now let's talk about isabel now people well first off let's talk about we're not going to give away any spoilers but as lifelong horror fans like we are and you were reading this script did you see that plot twist coming in this one no, because um, the producer who who spoke to me before hinted that there was something, but she didn't want to say too much, which which was good. Yeah. So it was on my radar that okay, they're going to try to do something, and then it totally, totally blindsided me. Me too. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know if it was because I was so into the script and forgot that I was looking for a twist, or I just wasn't looking for that twist, and. Wow. And it's, you know, it's, a, it's, it's you don't carried see it through to audience. Yeah. I'll tell you my reaction. I was sitting on the couch late at night. Everyone was asleep. I was watching the film. And when that twist happened, I literally sat up on the couch. I was sort of laying down. I sat up to watch the rest of the movie. That's how off-putting and just blindsided you. It came out of yeah. nowhere. Now, Isabel Furman, we got to talk about her transformation. People can understand the makeup part of it and, you know, make her look younger. Uh, Isabel is a average size height woman. She's about 5'3", five, 5'4". Five, uh, what did you guys do as a director? This was my question for the height issue. That I mean, how did you guys through the camera process make her look like she's four and a half, four and a half, five feet tall, even shorter? How'd you do it? There were a lot of, I mean, I feel like we probably used every trick in the book. Um, I don't know what that book is, but you know <laughs> what I mean? And um, so, you know, we created contraptions that we ultimately didn't use a lot of trial and error, like so that she wouldn't have to be on her knees, you know, yeah. which we did one test shoot day and she was on her knees like, oh, this is going to be really difficult. Yeah. So we created this buggy for her that she these two guys could move her around in and it rolled around and it, it didn't work really though. And so we kind of got rid of that. We, you know, we would build platforms where other characters would walk higher than her. And then what we realized that the easiest thing to do was to put everybody in platform boots. So if it was a scene, she's able to move around freely, but all the rest of the characters are six and a half, seven feet tall because they're in these eight inch platform boots Gotcha. and then they're moving around freely too mostly and then you know a lot of forced perspective which you know quite simply it's like you and i are next to each other but i'm three feet back yeah if the camera's in the right position it looks like we're next to each other but i'm smaller in actuality you know when they're trying to look yeah. at each other they're not even really looking at each other they're pretending to look at each other because they're not next to each other and uh and then where we put the camera, you know, it's like we would always be angled down on her. Um, we'd always give her kind of extra light. And um, it was it was such a challenge. Mm-hmm. It was the but it was super fun. It was just like solving a puzzle every day, every scene, getting together and going, all right, how are we going to approach this one? Once you know? one scene in particular as I was watching the film that I'm like, this must have been especially challenging is towards the beginning of the film that she steps up on a chair. Yeah. Uh, I mean, was that like particularly challenging to show her well, up on that chair? You know, what was cool is, is with the, and we used uh, two really great body doubles. Um, and so if you look at that scene, there are shots like from a high angle security camera from behind. Mm-hmm. So that's a little girl, you know, standing on that chair. And, uh, and then the guy was very tall. So, so those, you know, we call them a, Sometimes you call it a Texas switch where we will take like one actor or a stunt person and in camera, we'll switch that person out and you won't notice it. 
And in actuality, now you're looking at a double or now you're looking at the actor. Yeah. And, um, you know, there's that one shot that's kind of a one single shot mm -hmm. when she escapes. Um, I think there are four Texas switches in that scene. So we follow a little girl and then the camera passes her. And when the camera passes her, Isabel came out of a, one of the rooms and that little girl went inside the room and the camera doesn't cut. And then when we swing back around, Isabel's in frame. And then when Isabel takes off walking, she hides behind a wall, she peeks out. Yeah. And then when she boats back, a little girl takes her place and keeps walking. Wow. So then we follow the little girl. And and then we did it again to get her into the elevator. And um, so we did that several times in the movie. And it's a, it's a really fun, effective yeah. technique because you're like, oh wait, that's her walking. There's no camera cut really. You know, I'm a huge so. fan of the long shot. I don't know. I, <laughs> I've been for a while. It adds something to the film uh, when there is just one continuous scene. I had no idea you guys did that in one continual role. I mean, to me, yeah, that seems it, like you guys wanted a really hard day that day, but you pulled it off. Great. It was a crazy day. <laughs> and I don't think a lot of the crew were ready for it because it wasn't just the switching of her in the same shot and doing it all in like, you know, these big long takes, but all the doors had to open up yeah. exactly on time and the elevators. So you had crew members on every single door, timing it all out to make sure that it was timed where she swiped it. And it was, it was crazy. It was one of the, I mean, it was super fun. And when we were done, everybody was worn out and kind of all half pissed off <laughs> and half like, that was why we make movies. That you know? was, that like, was, that was so fun. Yeah. 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 Where, being a fan of the first one, when you started filming and Isabel got into character, what were your feelings? Were you like, you know, impressed, blown away on how she quickly got back into that character? It was incredible because she kind of tweaked her voice a little. She, you know, worked with the same, uh, acting coach with for her voice for mm -hmm. her um, accent mm -hmm. that she worked with on the original film when she was 10 years old and and seeing you know that i think probably the thing that makes the movie work really i mean it always starts with the script and in this case it couldn't be more true because remember the twist isn't just like an aha moment that now it answers the question to the whole movie it changes the whole it's the like, whole complexion of the movie for the last the second and third so act. It's, so it, it's it's a shift, you mm -hmm. know, as much as it's a twist. So that was so important in, in changing the tone of this movie. And uh, and with her, not I mean, never did she have any kind of worry about walking around dressed like herself at ten, with two or three body doubles running around that were you know a foot shorter than her. And she could have so easily felt like, what am I doing? Like, yeah. am I crazy for doing this, you know? And then the other actors too. But because she completely, you know, was 100% all in, it just made everybody on the crew, in the cast, just kind of like, yeah, like this is totally She's got legal. it, yeah, she's got you know? it. But it was, yeah, because she's if, if she's not worried, we're not worried, you know? Um, she was off in the corner of the set, like, crying before a take because she wants to go home because it was a huge mistake to do this you know she put herself out there to do it wow um it would have been a nightmare oh yeah and, um, and oh, then yeah. when she saw the first cut of the movie like if she would have called me and or she would have not returned my phone call after that <laughs> it, no. but she absolutely loved it so so it was uh she kind of set the tone for mm -hmm. everything and she was also the most important critic, you know, to the movie, to me. Let's switch over to Julia Stiles. I am a huge fan of Julia and have been for a long time. I think she's an amazing actress. First off, what was it like working with Julia? She's so, I expected her when I first talked to her to be, she's such a serious actor, right? She's such an accomplished actor. Mm -hmm. um, I was pretty frightened, I, I guess, maybe is what you'd say. And um, and worried about if I change something or and she was just like nothing, nothing bothered her at all. She was so cool about everything. 
you know, we were shooting in the dead of winter in Winnipeg. You know, sometimes it was negative 15 degrees. We were shooting nights. She's covered in blood, you know, but it, she's so believable, mm -hmm. you know, in what she does. So she has a show called Riviera that I watched a couple of years ago. And it's kind of like a dynasty kind of show mm -hmm. set in Europe. But she's so grounded that it makes this kind of silly world feel believable. And she brought the kind of same thing to this. And, you know, she told me at the beginning, she's like, Brim, please don't make me look like a giant in this movie. And I was like, no, you're not going to look like a giant. Um, and the fact that she just was able to have so much fun with Isabel and with Matthew Finland, who played her son. Yeah. Like they all just just had such a great time under such, you know, tricky circumstances. Absolutely. But um, I think it made such a difference having having her because she took what can be a pretty silly concept in some ways and just made it feel believable to me. Absolutely. Now, let's talk about her character, Trisha. Uh, Trisha could have been played a variety of different ways. Now, when Julia got cast, <clears throat> did you guys, uh, did you sort of sit back and listen to how she envisioned Trisha to be and you both got on the same page, vice versa? How did those conversations happen? I mean, I feel like, you know, sometimes they'll say 80% of directing is casting, mm -hmm. but um, if I'm casting somebody, it's like I'm kind of leaning into what they bring naturally, you yeah. know? It's like her comic timing, her sense of seriousness, like all those things, she has incredible instincts. And so we just wanted the character to be believable, yeah. you know? We wanted it... And and so we were on the same page about that. And um, if we played around with the scene, changed stuff, it's like she just snapped right into it. So it's like we we shared a very common vision on like who Trisha is, you know, That's and awesome. which made it so much easier. Now you know this is a prequel. Now so we yeah. see Esther making some mistakes. Uh, yeah, in the movie. Was that important, uh, both in the script and in the film, to show us that by the time she reaches the first movie that we saw many years ago, she did go through a learning process on manipulating people and how to calm yeah. the system? That was... Um, what, I don't want to give maybe anything away, but it's like um, Dave Leslie Johnson... When he described the, when we talked about the movie, and he described the movie to me. He was like, Esther learns to become a better sociopath in this yeah. story, and that was so. From the outset, that was a big goal of the movie. Is she certainly has done plenty in her past, I'm sure, and she has instincts which are not kind, <laughs> <laughs> but she, she, you know, sorry, she. Uh, she needed to learn like how to be better at what she was doing if she's gonna like pull off these situations that she finds herself in. Would you and, call uh, would you, would you call Esther a killer for fun or a killer for, out of necessity to get what she ultimately wants? Definitely not for fun. I think she enjoys it when she gets back at somebody. Yeah. But um, so she enjoys that side of killing someone, perhaps. But more than anything, you know, she's somebody who's gone through like a tough life. So to me, I'm uh, I'm like, you know, I really wanted to see that side of her where you would have empathy for kind of the situation she's in. So she puts herself like many sociopaths; they put mm -hmm. themselves in situations that are not sustainable, oh, yeah. like. Like if she wants to have a good life, she needs to live like an adult, mm -hmm. but she's probably been made fun of over and over in her life. And it's easier to pretend to be a child than it is sometimes to be this kind of woman with this condition. So I can imagine she's had her heart broken in all sorts of different ways and been wronged in different ways. So she puts herself in situations where killing is kind of the only way she can get out of it. 
but um you know i i but i don't think she's um evil really yeah i agree i completely agree with you now halfway through the film i actually found myself rooting for esther um uh, so if you haven't watched the film watch it because you know you got to find the reasoning behind that but anyway <laughs> was that done intentionally to sort of amp up the suspense factor of this film keep people on the edge of their seats yeah i mean i think that um you know hollywood has a tradition of rooting for the villain mm -hmm. rooting for the bad guy and we see all of our favorite franchises whether it be michael myers or hannibal lecter or jason Voorhees, anybody and it's like we follow the villain i mean yeah. we follow this murderer through multiple stories and in this case it was like an opportunity to show a side to her that we could relate to mm -hmm. and not only realize that you know she's somebody who um you know you want to see win for a change because the people around her may even be worse than she is yeah. um also i i love the idea the suspense the ticking bomb of going we know the characters in the movie may or may not know she's lying about her age, but they don't know how vicious she can be exactly. and how she's a ticking bomb, you know? And so I just love that idea of, you know, when across the story, uh, is she going to snap? Because mm -hmm. we know what she's capable of doing oh, yeah. if she does snap. And um, so for me, yeah, that that that's what hopefully rant, ratchets up the, the tension. And Absolutely. The is uh, wondering when is she going to finally lose it you uh -huh. know which is kind of exactly what she does yeah because she uh she goes through so many the, the character esther in this movie goes through so many different we see her in so many different phases uh yeah. moods and so on you guys have to watch because we're not giving away any spoilers i want to thank our guest tonight william brent bell the movie again is called orphan first kill it is streaming right now on paramount plus if you're not a current subscriber of Paramount Plus, they do have a seven-day free trial. Uh, you're going to love it. They have some great stuff on there. Make sure to check out this movie. You're absolutely going to love it, especially if you like the first one. Uh, like I told Brent before the interview, this is as good, if not better, than the original. And that is not something you say very often, especially in the horror genre. Brent, I want to thank you so much for coming on here. Any final thoughts you want to share before we go? Well, you know, I think just being in the conversation of being as good as the original is more than we could have hoped for or yeah. certainly was the goal. Um, so it's great to hear that. So I Absolutely. That. You did a fantastic job. Thank you to Brilliant Brent Thanks. Bell. Thank you to our audience, those who are tuning in live and those who will be watching this later on. Again, the movie Orphan First Kill streaming now on Paramount+. Plus. Until next time. On behalf of Brent and myself, stay safe and stay walking, everybody. Good night.